So hello, welcome to this panel conversation, which is part of our Days of Commoning event, which we're doing in collaboration with the We Are Commoners tour venue, uh, the Civic Arts Centre in Barnsley. I'm Emma Dacre, and I'm Exhibitions and Project Development Manager at Craft Space, which is based in Birmingham. And I'm also the co-curator of the We Are Commoners exhibition. Um, and joining me for this panel conversation are two of our exhibitors from We Are Commoners, uh, interdisciplinary artist and senior lecturer in jewellery and metalwork at Sheffield Hallam University, Rachel Coley, and sculptor and performer Shane Waltner, whose work draws inspiration from craft practice and dance and is rooted in ideas about ecology and reuse. And Shane is associated artist with Entelechy Arts. I haven't said that and right, have I, Shane? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> And is a member also of Ambient Jam and Arts Lecturer at UAL. So uh, just as means for a bit of introduction for anyone who's watching this who hasn't been able to see the We Are Commoners exhibition yet, um, the exhibition invites you, visitors, to become or recognise yourselves as a commoner. In the exhibition, the skills and materials that are utilised in the artist's projects provide ideas and inspiration to common and also give in insight into examples of commoning. So through the development of the exhibition, we worked with a network of academics and artists, the exhibitors, um, in the Crafting Commons network. And through that network, we felt that activating the verb to common is a good way of trying to renew public life and that the acts of commoning can be woven into every aspect of life and become a way of living for all of us. Um, a life where we can connect to produce shared rituals and resources that we all look after together, which seems more and more um, in need in current times. Um, so we think that people could do this by getting involved through cooperation, mutual care and exchange, which can heal and make change, significant change in our communities. So um, I'll just share a quote that during the exhibition development, we felt summed up the meaning of commons well, um, and we used it for the development of the exhibition. And it's a quote from Peter Barnes, who's the founder of the forum and publication on the commons. And it's the commons means things we share, places we share, systems we share, ideas we share, culture we share. And that just really reiterates that commoning can just get involved in all, all aspects of our lives. So that brings us to kind of to the subject for this conversation. And as I said, it's part of our Days of Commoning event that we're holding at the Civic. And the theme of that day is ideas around nature and the commons through craft. Um, so uh, we're going to talk about that and how we think about use and care for nature, this shared resource. So before we begin, um, proper with the conversation. I was hoping Rachel and Shane, you could give us an overview of your practice and the exhibition work in relation to the theme. So Rachel, if you'd like to go first. Thanks, Emma. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hello, everyone. So um, I'm Rachel and I work across jewellery, cutlery and sculpture, uh, mainly working with metal, but also a wide range of materials. And um, I love uh, working with materials, really, especially food waste materials. And for this project, um, combining that with other organic natural materials. Um, I was one of the commissioned artists to produce a piece of work for We Are Commoners. And um, I, I was working on the commission during the first um, COVID-19 lockdown in 2020. And uh, yeah, I've, I made a series of material tests and samples and also a range of jewellery uh, out of organic natural materials that is meant to be a kind of proposition for what the future of uh, commercial or costume jewellery could become. Thank you, Rachel. Shane? Hello. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, so I'm Shane. I'm uh, trained uh, as a sculptor. I see myself as a maker interested in um, a whole range of techniques, processes, um, and uh, they're interested in the, the, the process of making and um, have been for a while um, and making that visible in the production of work. Um, I've worked a lot in participatory settings, um, witnessed people making things collectively, 
Um, and through that, I've got interested in finding ways of choreographing the making process. And that's led me to work with dancers and performers. Um, and rather than present finished object, really uh, feature or highlight the making of something. Um, thinking that the making of something holds a lot of history, holds a lot of narrative. Um, it shows people engaging with process, which uh, sometimes, and in the context of the, this exhibition, actually also prompts people to engage with the work and do something in the gallery space. Um, so at the start of um, the commission, I met up with a, a dancer and we um, worked outdoors and created a series of um, commoning actions. Uh, which are performative pieces, which um, are recorded as scores um, and in different ways with different audiences, these scores are now being performed uh, by a group of people, uh, such as in the case of the exhibition, there's two, two scores that are performed within the show um, and a new one to be performed very soon. Um, and Emma, you will talk about that some more. Yes. <laughs> well, I'll just say before I forget as well, if anyone hasn't seen your work, there is a virtual tour of the exhibition on the Craft Space website where they can see both your pieces for the exhibition, but there's also an artist page where the Common Agency Projects, Common Action 14 film is, so people can see that there as well. Um, but yes, thank you for that, that overview. That's really good. Um, so as you know, I've mentioned that uh, the Focus Five Days of Commoning event that's happening this weekend, while we're recording this, but who knows when people will be watching it. Um, we're holding that Civic is exploring ideas about nature and commons through craft. And while I've been planning it, uh, Shane, I've gone back to kind of the exhibition text and things. And I was really drawn to the quote you used um, by Sean Swallow. Um, in describing uh, the work that you've done for the exhibition with Common Agency Projects, uh, which was on so many levels, including personal and political, nature and the environment are our remaining and shared common language. So I was wondering if you could speak a bit about why that you used that quote, how it spoke to you about what you were thinking around with your work and mm -hmm. how um, nature is a form of commons and, and how craft is a vehicle to explore. That. Yes, yes. And, and uh, well, the, the quote struck me. So I, I, I met Sean Swallow, who's a poet who lives in Wales and um, on Instagram, um, <laughs> a sort of um, um, commons of knowledge. And, um, and, um, and I was struck by that quotation and we sort of talked a little um, and struck by it. Uh, in terms of it, you know, it's our last remaining common language, but actually, is it really? Are we really connected? Do we speak the same language? And, and for me, that was a, a starting point to do the work uh, Laura and I did um, as common agency projects, um, because um, that language, a lot of languages are being lost. <laughs> And I think that language is being lost as well. Our connection with the environment, um, our connection with nature. We are part of nature, but we're so distanced from it. Um, and uh, however, nature, being part of nature, it is what sustains us. And we need to think as well about sustaining it. Um, we need to think about nature as a... Um, a sort of a shared resource with us in it. And so that really, for me, encapsulates the idea of nature as a commons. If we think about um, the, the, the simple definition for me of, of commons is um, the idea of a shared resource with people in it. Um, it's kind of derived or borrowed really from, from Tim Ingold, an anthropologist, who talks about um, anthropology, anthropology or defines anthropology as philosophy with people in it, you know, kind of a nice yeah. ring to it. Um, but uh, yes, finding ways through the work we do to reconnect, to engage in a physical way with our environment and doing that, understand more about it, remember what we've kind of lost. Um, and um, yeah. And that I hope that answers the 
Yes, yeah, it does. The it's question and, uh, or, you know, it wasn't a question, but really thinking about that idea of shared language and how so much of it is misinterpreted or misunderstood um, and how we can learn it again and yeah. not mm -hmm. maybe lose the nuances of it. Um, yeah, I think the work that you do, you, that you and Laura have done for the project is, is beautiful. I, I really love it. And um, I was wondering about that, um, that connection of you both in, in sort of natural spaces and the importance of doing it um, in, these, in, in these very open and accessible public spaces and how, how you feel that differs from maybe other um, locations that you've done these, that produce the scores in or, or done performances in before. Mm. Um, there's, a, there's a kind of a, the, the risk we're taking as we do this in, in public, um, we're rehearsing, we're testing out ideas. We, um, we often started without thinking too much about what we were going to do. There was very little planning um, and really enjoy that. However, we were in a public space. We were seen by the people. And so that was something we certainly felt, uh, but it was important to, to start with a sort of a, a, a very much an open mind and uh, work in an improvisational way, uh, work site responsibly, remember how we used to all play. And as adults, of course, we forget. Uh, we kind of, uh, a lot of boundaries or rules or ways of being in certain places um, are self-imposed by us and sort of other people. Um, so, um, but the, it, it, so there were some, some hurdles. It was difficult to work in some way, but it was also very, very easy because nature, the environment just facilitated us. So um, as a maker, I'm used to transforming things, shaping things. And, and here working with Lara, who is not a maker, but a performer, um, really open my eyes, both our eyes, really to sort of being moved or shaped by things. And so we we're being sculpted by the landscape. And, and so there was this kind of to and fro between us and it, um, which, was, which made the work for us very exciting and hopefully for our audiences as well. <laughs> um, it's interesting you saying about risk because we had a lot of discussions, or I did with some of the artists while they were developing their work about, uh, the tragedy of the commons is that there, there needs to be rules and things for it to, to still work. And I think you spoke about rules there and you develop the scores as well, um, showing for your performances, which could be seen as a set of rules. That's so it's true. It's true. Yeah. And yeah. I was just, yeah. I was also wondering yeah. about the, the risk as well. You saying about being in public as well. Um, did that lead to any kind of interesting conversations questions as you were developing your ideas and it it did it did quite a bit was shared Laura and I were recording with um grasses and we the idea we had was to create a a, a temporary boundary in space and um so we we walked close together corded some grass linked it together and then just proceeded to walk apart from one another as we walked gathering or sort of um, taking grass from the ground and sort of making this cord, which eventually became so big that we were interfering with people, dog walkers. And, and, <laughs> um, and so it was, it was all this negotiation. A lot of people, we had a lot of conversation, a lot of people avoided us. It's worth mentioning as well. You know, it's like, oh, they're doing very, something very strange there. I'm not quite sure what that is. And so there was no conversation. Um, but um, yes, people came and said, oh, I remember how to, you know, I used to do this as a child. Mm -hmm. Uh, it reminds me of, of a festival I went to, um, and, uh, and people questioned also, it's quite interesting, the, uh, you know, is this, you know, how productive we were being, and surely it is an easier way of doing this, and, um, and is this the best use of your time, and uh, what's it worth? So very, very um, 
capitalistic way of thinking about things. And so, so you're spending time doing this. It is labor, it is work, and what do you get from it? And, and uh, the philosopher is very clear as to what we're getting from it. It's very direct enjoyment from making something with things we've just found around us and, and working with in a very instinctive way. Um, so, yeah, a lot of questioning. Um, and sort of a few anecdotes thrown in and people joining us as well. So at one point that one line became, you know, a, a triangular shape as people just started calling themselves and, and were then instructing us as to how to do it, which I loved as well. Oh, that's a lovely exchange, isn't it? Yeah. yeah so and I, it's interesting you're saying about people saying they remember doing things like that. I think there's... Um, there's two things you, you said, the, the idea about people saying, oh, I used to do that and they've forgotten. So how they, like you say, we don't play anymore. People interact with nature perhaps a lot more when they're little, you mm. know, making daisy chains or grass things and stuff. And then you just kind of grow out of it and forget about how you've been in nature. But mm. also the, the value people place on, on things, whether it was yes, your yeah. time doing it yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And then that that common ground, that open space parkland, is um, uh, particularly in an urban con in uh, in an urban context has the uh, or gives you permission to do all sorts of things, and, mm. and um, but not all of them are necessarily beneficial to the environment you're in either. There are certain rules and codes, and and the wildlife who are the residents there, not visitors like us, actually really be are really interfered with. So over the, the COVID period, a lot of dog walkers, an increased number of dog walkers used the park and the skylarks went, um, oh. you know, were made homeless and um, all these desire lines everywhere, all this compressed ground, which uh, it was also very dry. Mm -hmm summer so the sort of trees went to duress and and uh, all the ground compacted around them um, and we were to some extent just destroying habitats too just plucking grass where we wished and just uh, being very careless in some ways um, <laughs> while of course celebrating an ancient craft of cordage which completely transformed the course of humanity as people could make cord, build things, make baskets, store things, and we stopped being hunter-gatherers and became uh, more sedentary, or better, mm. or worse. But, um, yeah. It's interesting about the, you saying about the effects, you know, the more dog walkers had the skylarks, things like that, because for, for me, during the lockdowns and things you just heard about you know hearing birds more which I definitely did canals being greener you just heard the, the kind of more positive aspects on, on, on nature rather than those that's yes. what I think I'd heard before yeah 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 no I work in an ecological park and and since lockdown they've had to put so many more fences and barriers because the mm. ecological park has been um, uh, harmed um, you know, through too many people walking and the foxes were, were killed by the sort of Jack Russells and, um, mm. you know. The, the Which brings back to that idea of the tragedy of the commons, that kind of open space, then how it's how it's managed and used and respected yes. and, and people's understanding of it, I guess. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. It was, the, the park it was, it was about 30 years old and at the start, there was money to put a fence around it and making only accessible during the day. And the site manager, who still works there now, um, decided not to. And post lockdown, really regrets it. Well, it's a shame, isn't it? Um, yeah, so, so um, Rachel, a bit more about your work, perhaps. Your yours uh, differs from Shane and Laura working directly in nature in that you're utilising organic materials from natural locations. Um, I wondered how you feel your use of the shared resource benefits common thinking or encourages common in, in other people. Yeah, I thank you. I know, I think um, it, there, I feel like there are lots of connections between what Shane and Lara were doing and, and also what I was sort of doing, but in they, they were 
sort of commoning together as I was very much going out on my daily walk and um what I was doing was was gleaning I suppose um different organic materials that I could find along my route um and I, I suppose that took me to the point of of being a lot more observant of my surroundings and lo really looking at materials and looking at their specific qualities. Um, and I was accessing um, the the resources that most people can access with uh, on the internet, looking at YouTube videos. Um, one of which uh, Shane recommended to me, which I think was the the Cordage one, the Ramiers um, one. So I was. Um, I had a go um, with Shane's guidance, at having uh, some metal cordage to to make the um, the connections because I was I was trying to use all the organic materials within the piece. So the idea was that I would go out and glean um, organic materials from a specific site on my walk and um, make something out of them. So I wanted again for it to be. Um, open and accessible as much as possible, really, and, and as simple as possible to create. And that was that was ideal, considering it was lockdown and I didn't have access to a workshop anyway. So you're kind of <coughs> limited um, with what you can achieve. So I was using quite basic tools and having to uh, cut things with quite basic garden saws that you would use to um, to look at hedges and trees and things that are more openly accessible than, than maybe jewellery equipment might be to some people. Um, so that's what I was using to, to make pieces. And I found it actually quite um, calming, uh, rejuvenating as part of my, my recovery of, of the of that time where there's a lot of I know that a lot of people were suffering with grief and anxiety um, and what I what I ended up doing was there was a hedge along my route that had been um, really quite um, badly cut down by the local farmer that thrash cutting that they do where it sort of rips it apart and it's very kind of not not neatly cut so each day I was going out with my saw and trying to um, care for the hedge and try to look after it and 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 provide a kind of act of commoning for that very um minimal area on along the verge there that is is i suppose um could be considered common common land in some way um and and gathering up what i could and then having this weighted backpack i also felt like that gave me this sense of um of calm as well i think um the idea, I know that many people use weighted blankets and things like that, and I, I am autistic um, and I found that having that weight, particularly when I'm walking, has been very helpful in uh, enabling me to um, release the anxiety that I'm experiencing. So it, it was more uh, very much like Shane's saying, it's, it's, it's kind of more in the making and in the process of doing that I feel like um, there was the healing and the sharing. Almost sometimes the, the outcomes are kind of just, they, they are what they are, but, but in this case, what I was doing in processing the, the wood from the hedge and making neck pieces was, I was also saving the, um, the waste that I was creating from that making process and using that to combine it with food waste that I was also generating during that time to make these organic material samples um, that I then could also make into a, another jewellery series. So there were sort of different iterations and stages within it. And therefore some of the designs for the jewellery, uh, some, some I think are a lot more interesting than others. Others are quite basic and um, hopefully they're, they're something that most people could make themselves with basic access to, to, um, to more general tools and equipment that's more readily accessible, especially with maker spaces becoming more available in, in town and city areas um, for people who are interested in making. I thought it's important that, um, that parts of it are accessible. And so my proposal is that, as I said before, that you could make um, jewellery that you may only wear once or twice but instead of buying it from the high street and buying it in these um, plastic materials or base metals that will break easily get lost or damaged 
that you can make it from organic materials and waste materials that you're generating yourself or that you gather yourself on a walk that you are attracted to, that you find beautiful and have a, have a really interesting quality. Um, maybe a lovely smell as well, you know, just even going into those areas of, of nature and, and experiencing them in a more sensory way, I find really um, beneficial. So kind of encouraging all of those aspects and then putting them back on the body. Uh, again, I think the heat and the moisture from the body can, can reawaken those, those sensory um, experiences and also wearing them, they're, they're quite big, uh, quite weighty pieces. And I quite liked wearing quite a few of them. So again, it brings me back to that idea of being weighted, being grounded, and that that experience was helpful, especially during that, um, that period of, of the lockdowns. Yeah. I think you're saying about the, the encouraging people um, to, to kind of do it themselves. It just made me think mm. about, all the times I've, I've been beach walking and picked up stones or I pick up leaves that just look really beautiful and then might take a photo of it and put it on Instagram and then, you know, that's, that's all I do with it. There's, people are picking things up all the time that they just don't have any, any idea what to do with. So it's a way of, of um, developing that, isn't it? The other thing I wanted to pick up on was um, the gleaning a bit more because I remember reading about when you you were developing your work and and you were sending me proposals and stuff and it was all getting really exciting but it's the, the gleaning's like a historical mm. process isn't it in in the in the farm mm -hmm. area or, or or with hedgerows is that right and, yeah and it's yeah. it's it's the waste of that you were using so it's not like you were just mm. picking stuff off it was waste from a, a process yes. that's been around a long time yeah so I was um I was um yeah in a kind of more slightly more suburban rural setting so I can walk around the streets or I can also walk around um uh, through the footpaths in farmers fields and things so yeah like you're saying the historic um nature of gleaning was that you would take in the harvest but then you would make sure that you collected every sort of scrap of everything left and and gleaning was sort of all all the bits that maybe you'd missed or they might be um slightly kind of rolled around and a little bit wonky or whatever like the wonky fruit and veg you can buy in the shops these days and so I think it's that sort of sense of, of really um of really I suppose um wanting to I, I'm losing my words but wanting to really um respect uh the 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 harvest and and gather every every morsel that you can that's usable and that's workable and I think that that's what you do as a creative as well like you're saying and, and you you're really observant and you're really looking for all the potential that you can see around you so I think it's it's in that broader sense that you're going out and looking at things with that creative perspective of actually what are the properties that I can see here and how could I make use of those um, in, in what I'm trying to achieve and really trying to see as you're saying kind of the beauty in that pebble that you want to pick up or the leaf and how how that color is is formed and transformed in in that work how you might then um, make something from it that's beautiful and that, that you can wear to then kind of raise a comment about so I work a lot within the idea of cause jewelry and that it's that idea that the jewellery can highlight a particular issue, such as commoning, that can then spark a conversation through you wearing that piece and people making a comment and um, that you can, it, it gives you a chance to start a conversation because I'm sometimes, I'm not that good at starting conversations. <laughs> I know the ways it, hel it helps me <laughs> to talk about through things and through materials. That's great. That's, I just had a thought then and it's kind of gone. But I was thinking about, um, no, sorry, it's gone. It's all right. <laughs> I have to move on. Um, well, we were, I think it's, it's nice to hear. I mean, I, I, I think the work um, Rachel has done is, is wonderful for the show. And there's a, a connection in both our practice. It's really working with an economy of means. And that is a, is a form of care as well, making the most mm. of something. Um, yeah. honouring that material, honouring the tradition of doing something with very little. Um, and, and out of necessity, amazing things happen that 
you know, the victim out of necessity comes invention or new invention. Um, and this uh, the situation and during in, in um, during numerous lockdowns was well, so actually we, I can't do things the way I normally do it do things. I don't have access to this, and so you rethink, you shed habits, and you do things in a different way, and you rediscover things, and and um, and those things that might not last um, are not less precious for it. It's, um, mm. um, and kind of embracing the 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 ephemeral as well yes mm, yeah. yeah and let things and that's great to let things go had i have to mention this great moment i had today i was working with a group of students we went beachcombing and we found all these things and um clay pipes and and to be expected to be found, found on the thames but all sorts of other materials we made a little show on the on the bank talked about the things we most preferred we liked and and what narratives emerge from those things and then we had a moment where we all stood by the riverside and threw everything back <laughs> <laughs> and i said ah that that bit of flint 65 million years old shaved over so much time <laughs> off it goes <laughs> <laughs> I'm not standing in the way of its history um so and that that's great and it's 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 remembered I mean that in itself is a, that's that's another commenting action actually I'll have to write that one down <laughs> that's a great one I'd love to do that I do I'd love to have a go at mudlarking on the Thames that would be yes. really fun well next time you're in London yeah thank you <laughs> yeah, another network yeah, that's it. Networking event. That'd be it's good. come back to me with Shane saying about that, with talking about economy of means. And I think, again, that's becoming so important now in the current uh, crisis, cost of living crisis and, and things like that that we're experiencing. But what I was thinking when you were saying, or, or all that you were saying, Rachel, about um, the um, materials that people can use and find and economy of means, that... Um, you're sharing your ideas where you can as well, which is also a way of commenting, freely sharing those ideas so that other people can take them on and use them as well. Um, yeah, which is fantastic yeah. too. I think that's it's difficult, isn't it? Because I feel like in my uh, my other other parts of my craft practice, I think that sometimes it's important to make those specific choices as to what part of the process you want to keep an air of mystery around so yeah. that there's that there's that sort of spark of interest whereas I think sometimes it can if you're too explicit about certain processes it can lose the magic as well for for that but yeah I, I you know like you were saying before Emma I feel like with this project it's so freeing and I was drawing on all those experiences like Shane saying like making um, daisy chains when when you were a child and you were there playing it within nature and making adornment more freely and um and not really uh getting to the point where you're worrying or questioning about the materials properties or how you work with them and I, you know I was very inspired also because obviously I, I love food and making jewelry out of food and things so the pasta necklaces as well and all that kind of thing is, is are all of those ideas that I that I was drawing from and harking back to and I think um that there was also a comfort in that in doing that during the lockdown period where you feel like you're kind of it's again part I think of the grounding experience of it of the making and going back to something that is basic and I think as a maker as well you often feel like you need to make everything really well all the designs need to be brilliant and it, and it was actually such a freeing experience to just be making things within a certain limitation and things that you we knew were a lot more accessible to other people and that, that people can more freely just join in with and that there's a lot less pressure in it being an amazing jewellery design if you're just going to wear it once or twice and then to go on your daily walk again and just return it to where you got the materials from in the first place and doing that kind of circular design idea um, really quickly within jewellery is actually quite um, quite different to what jewellery has developed into over the years being in precious metals and mm. precious gemstones they're things that generally outlive you they become heirlooms um, they're, you know, they're things that are looked at in archaeological digs as these artifacts that just come out of the ground and often just look 
very similar to how they might have gone in the ground in the first place, which is incredible. But I think that's where it's interesting for me in the, the context of using jewellery um, is, is that idea of it being this, um, this, this idea that it, uh, it has a shorter lifespan and that it's, you're actually thinking about the end point of that product at the beginning and really taking that into consideration so that you, you have it as part of the whole experience there. It is a, it is a real mind shift though, isn't it? Um, I'm mm. quite a sentimental person. I keep lots of, you know, silly things to help remember stuff and, and jewellery I buy with a view to think, you know, thinking I'll have it forever. Um, so it is that that mind shift, but a, an exciting one, I think, as well. But it is maybe about balance, too. You know, it doesn't all have to, to be like that balance in your practice as well with what you produce that you freely share and, and then what you might keep. That that was some discussions that came up as well, actually, wasn't it, in the in the network about that balance for craftspeople, particularly with the kind of historically with the guilds that have been quite closed organizations mm -hmm. how, how much can be shared if you've still got to make a living from your work as well so yeah there's lots of different um, areas we could go into you're saying that if you're ex too explicit about process you um there's a loss of mystery about the object might lose a certain mystique um but um but that, that's that's yeah. But converse, you know, in, in contradiction to this, actually, the the scores, for instance, that are can be reinterpreted um, endlessly. Uh, aware that the a process, an action, is uh, shared and made very public, then um, allows for sort of transformation, reinvention, rethinking, and uh, and so visual artists can be very be very uh, protective about what they do and they work towards a single thing a unique object uh but performers constantly are passed things on you know are given things mm. scores scripts musical notation dance notation mm. reinterpret it and that is a great form great way of keeping things alive or moving and and uh, and just a sim very simply a, a great way of sharing things sharing experiences um, and we can think of school making as a as a form of commons as well. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think um, I think actually there's an awful lot of sharing that goes on in in making communities, aren't there? And and, and but also like you say, different reinterpretations. Like everybody you speak to will have a slightly different take on a particular technique that they've learned or that they were taught a certain way by. Um, by somebody who taught them in the past. And, and I think that's the kind of beauty of how these things kind of move and morph and transform through through the ages and respond to our times in different ways. Um, but yeah, it, it is interesting that that kind of uh, uh, those choices in what you what information you you share and, and what you what you what you aren't perhaps so obviously sharing, I think. Yeah. Um, hmm. lots to think about <laughs> so I've got we, we've talked a bit about sustainable ways of working you're both very um, focused on that and the impact of the environment um, so I think we've discussed this a bit but is there anything else you kind of want to say about how craft works as a vehicle to explore and highlight issues that you're working with or do you feel you've covered that I think that um, it's it, craft. Craft is is so important. We're kind of the counter to the the world of mass produced products, and um, you know we're if you're talking about. I think people talk about that kind of idea of working in tens, hundreds of thousands, you know, ten thousands of, of things. You know, we're we're very much at the the smaller scale of those things and hopefully working in a much more considered and considerate way um but um yeah i think uh, i'm sure shane's probably experienced this as well i've talked to quite a lot of makers over the past few years who've become a lot more sensitive um, and aware of the fact that we're we're creating more stuff in the in this world um 
and um, more aware of the waste that we're all generating and how can we identify um, different waste streams within our localities, especially to try to work within those and um, use our skills and how we perceive materials and, and transform materials through our, our craft skills into something that could be a new product. And, and that's um, and the area within the circular design economy that I'm, I'm really interested in, in learning more about and seeing more makers kind of working towards that that idea and and also trying to do that as part, a part of my teaching job as well to uh, for us to all have more consideration over over that in general around our practice um yeah yeah i think um i think uh, well yeah craft is really about a better understanding of the stuff around us and and, and how to work with what's there um, mm. And then as you do this, you kind of, you think about your position within that situation, your surroundings, the, uh, the things that um, you impact on and things that impact on you. Um, and um, kind of at the end, we weren't many, with many of the scores with Lau, we weren't really making, but actually we were finding out a lot about our environment and how to work with it. Um, and uh, and that knowledge that's gained informs what I talk about with my students and how I approach. You know, I do they? I teach on several courses, but the uh, the, the furniture students um, have an expectation to make things, make pieces, um, but I really get them to dance with materials. <laughs> <laughs> and, and just really think with their whole body because it's a lot of product design and furniture design is about sitting in front of a computer and really thinking mm. up here but not with the body and and um and you can only go so far working in that way i think and, and it's about finding a balance really so uh, i think not knowing what you're doing but responding to the smell of the widow you've just stripped and then you know how the bark behaves and, do, and finding then a, a way to work with that and a use for that material i think um, you have started um, the process i don't know if you're doing it before shane but with the the commission for we are commoners you were starting to grow your own um is it flax or no yes it was, yes. Flax, yes 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 and then you've yes. been developing the um is it soft pots on I've seen on, on Instagram. Yes, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're, yes, you're using um, existing materials as well in making. Yes, being passed on, being given clothes, and then repurposing them and um, into these soft pots of containers, um, and finding out by taking something apart, finding out how it's been made, and then allowing that to inspire how I stitch the pot together. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm kind of connecting with the maker, connecting with the technique, and and, um, and um, yeah, that's been that's been great. I'm really working with that jumper, <laughs> yeah, know, telling me something, and, and it's got its own agency. There's some things I can't do with it, and so this idea of of a common agency when working with materials, the materials will tell you what to do. And I, mm. I really really love that that idea. Um, and uh, the, growing the flax, that uh, I'm re really interested in the idea of a, uh, a fiber shed. And um, I live part time in Essex, and the idea of, of building a fiber shed there, which is connecting growers with um, of plants that might be used for fiber, uh, connecting those with the people who process them, and designers, and sort of to make local clothing really that's produced within one particular locality. Um, so that's involved me growing flax for I mean, this is the third year I'm doing it. I still haven't really processed the first year's harvest, another thing. I know how to do it. I've done a little bit of it. I'm much better at spinning than I used to be and not bad on the loom as well. But um, yes, I think it's just me doing it. But ultimately, the idea is to to open it out and have people involved in the 
And there's a few people involved already, including the farmer who's allowing me to grow flax on his land. And, um, okay. and would you would that be part of this? Because there's a fibre shed network, isn't there? There in is, the there is. There, there isn't in the east of England. There's one in quite an active one in the west, west country, and, and then yeah. in, in the northeast as well, producing denim from flat from flax from, from linen mm -hmm. as an alternative to cotton denim. Um, yes, gosh, it's a broad practice. Sometimes, sometimes I think it's too broad. You see, Fazerby <laughs> just wants to be. Oh, it's not the right place to say it, but maybe I should give up dance and just become a potter. I mean, I love making pots. You heard and it here simple. first. <laughs> After years of making quite complicated conceptual work across different disciplines, I could just say I'm a potter and I make soft pots. They don't even break. You can put them in your pocket. <laughs> <laughs> maybe it's time to decide. <laughs> time to decide. Ah, oh, it's been time to decide for a long time, I can tell you. <laughs> So, um, wow. so, yeah, we've talked a bit about, obviously, the pandemic is something that, you know, everyone's, everyone's been through. It was a really big part of developing this exhibition. We've touched on it a bit, but it did create that kind of stark widespread realisation of the importance of our green spaces um, that are often at threat with privatisation, uh, which is a theme of the exhibition, of course. And looking at common land and common resources. But these green spaces obviously, well publicised, became vital to people's well-being during the, the lockdowns, uh, particularly people who don't have outside space within their own homes. Um, and as I said, with much of, our, of the development work for the exhibition, all of you artists working on your commissions throughout 2020, um, we all became more aware of the themes of care and healing through commoning that's possible through commoning and commoning actions. And we had our network as part of the exhibition development with the academics crafting the commons network. And there were discussions about this theme of care and healing coming through, but about how nature and public spaces hold us. I know Linda Brothwell in her work um, was looking at public spaces and the benches that used in, in public spaces and how they can they can hold you in that sense of supporting you. And I think I've seen you reference that, Shane, in your writing about your work as well. So I just kind of wanted to, to touch on that, really, how we see nature holding us and, and how we, maybe we need to think about how we can hold and support nature in return. Yes, I think it's, it's a two-way thing. I mean, nature provides, but are we providing for it? And um, yes, back in 2019, the park, we, so Laura and I met in Monstered Flats, but it was the case for parks all across the country, really, where we were used um, uh, a lot for all sorts of things, you know, it became like little cultural hotspots and uh, people going there to be entertained, to entertain, um, relaxation, exercise, um, prayer meetings, barbecues, raves. We've met a family of, from in Hackney who thought the park was too busy during the day and so would just congregate and have a late meals, 11, 12 o'clock at night in the little cops we were, that we used to rehearse in. Um, and yeah, that was great. But as I say, there was a, there's, there's a price to pay in those areas where mm. it does suffer. I'm quite interested in having experienced that, having all of us having reconnected and, and um, thinking how valuable being outdoors is and experience how you know in, is uh, um, experiencing the elements uh, is a human need. Um, interested in how we can maybe bring nature back indoors or inside, and in a way that's with this last score we're going to well the later score we're going to perform at Days of Commoning. Um, it's about how can we behave indoors as we would in a park how, we can, how can we create this a, 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 an environment that supports us sustains us helps us as being in a forest does when you kind of forest bathe um, so that's a consideration uh, Lara and I have um, 
and it came out of actually wanting to reach out with the work to people who might not have access to parkland or uh, but uh, maybe we can really make the most of part of you know, your cultivated busy Lizzie in the sitting room. <laughs> and that <laughs> can be a transformative and transportative experience. Um, so. There's also those people, I guess, that are still having to be really careful and are still fearful um, and not going out. So still yeah. um, thinking of those people and, and trying to include them in, in those, yeah. what the, the practices that you're doing. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I think for me, it's, it's, a, it's, I suppose it's a bit a lot more literal. I felt like the jewellery, I felt very much held by nature, like I was saying, with the weighted nature of some of the pieces um, and wearing them again out in nature as well. And um, it was, it was interesting. Uh, but yeah, I really love what, what Shane's talking about and that idea of, of it being more accessible. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing or experiencing the new score um yeah that would be that would be lovely really exciting yeah. thank you yeah we'll send it to you Rachel. you can take part in the digital on a uh, mass make on sunday yeah sounds good look at my latest instagram post <laughs> I think... little, little plug, plug yeah. There. <laughs> <laughs> um yes how to get comfortable with very little um, Mm. So, yeah. so Shane, as we're touching on common agency projects and the work that you're going to be doing for the days of commoning, you've now developed 20 commoning actions with Lau. I think the, the one you're doing for the days of commoning is the 20th, which is yes. fantastic. We've got 14 and 15 in the exhibition. Um, and some of these have involved other people directly. Obviously, you've talked about people passing by and things, but you have invited people to be part of of the actions and developing scores with you um, and they've observed and commented on this as well how how have people responded and has it changed their views about nature and their place in nature or how they view it i i yes i think so we we had a we went public in a different way with the with the um with some of the commenting actions so we we curated an event and and invited people to come and, um, and 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 it was a kind of sharing really sort of how does it how would it be to perform in front of an invited audience had an idea well we still have this idea to to grow that a little bit and, and um, have a, a wider audience come and see things um, toying with the idea of, of uh, inviting people to perform some of the things with us. Some of the common air actions lend themselves to that. There's one which is a, a very simple score of, of it's a bit like follow the leader, but you do exactly what the person in front of you does and, and people then join us or, um, or somebody goes in between and then I'll go through the line of people just end up doing something else. Um, so um, yeah, it was great experience to do it in front of these small groups of people to um, to see how long we could hold people's attention uh, to also see what people who weren't invited how they engaged with it and, and the numbers grew um, as we did this um, and it helped us give us some ideas as to how to one sort of curate a sort of this bigger public event um, in Wanstead Flats involving communities there and different groups and how would it, we would do that um, and then um, yeah I mean one idea leads to another so it's, it's an ongoing thing I mean I never we never planned at the start of this commission to do 20 commoning actions it was just going to be one piece of work and, and, but that wasn't enough <laughs> somehow we're still trying to answer the brief and then with that we've got the whole trail of <laughs> I, think I saw i saw somewhere i think it was on one of your blog posts that people had had said it, it made them kind of look at their surroundings differently they felt um within the space differently because they were just more aware of of like the impressions you were making in the area um, and yes. looking at the different 
things. Yes, noticing things. I mean, there's mm. you, it's very you can easily walk through space, any space, and really not and in your head. Or if you notice a few things, you'll notice the things you usually notice. And uh, there's one piece where Lara and I, um, having moved through a, a small copse of acacia trees, uh, where we try and really limit the number of footsteps we take on the ground. Um, so we're just hanging the, on the ground like gibbons, monkeys, just and then testing the, the flexibility of this branch and can I reach out to another and then letting go and hoping you reach the other trunk. So having, and acacia trees, by the way, are full of thorns. So we have to be very, very careful doing this. Um, that's something the audience didn't really pick up on. The danger we were putting ourselves on. <laughs> But, and then we emerge onto this, this grassland, which looks completely flat, it's monster flats, but actually it's like this. And so we, we proceed to follow one another, trying to match one's, each other's rhythm, and then we fall over. And then, and the way we fall indicates how rough the terrain is. And then we're trying to find a place of rest and comfort. It doesn't quite, now that bump is just there on my back, and so it's just rise again. And so, um, and people were saying, oh, God, that ground there is so, um, so not what I was expecting. Um, and despite the discomfort, actually those little spaces that we did found and we did niche in, uh, which is wonderful. It was very much about grounding, about finding the ground and, and using it uh, in a very different way than you would otherwise, um, and so that I think that was quite well communicated to the, the people who saw it. Um, mm. That's great. <laughs> and Rachel, you've done um, some a workshop for us in one of our previous days of Commoning at Mac, where you were working with doing a drop-in session, doing the jewelry uh, with found organic materials and food waste I just wondered yeah. what people's kind of response to that was and whether it, you'd had any comments about nature and, and making and yeah I I mean it was first of all it was a lovely day um thank you for for that um and the Mac was a, a lovely setting for it because it's it's yeah it's in the parklands isn't it and um people had the opportunity to go out and forage for their own materials so again encouraging them to explore that um common shared space and to really observe the materials there and the beauty of the organic uh, things that they could find and bring back the things that they wanted to to kind of treasure and uh, and make into something that that they could use as a as a vehicle to discuss uh, common common thinking um so it it was a it was a lovely day um there were it was lovely to work with some kids as well and just really freely playing with different things there was some food, uh, some fruit there that you could eat and then use the the waste that you'd created there to combine it with some organic materials to to make just some quick pendants really um, and that was quite nice because um, it also brings a pop of colour into it whether it's with orange peel or banana peel you've got those beautiful bright oranges and yellows um, along with uh, I think that's that's a bit of the downside for me in working with organic materials is that they can start off as these beautiful amazing popping colours and then over time if you do sort of keep them for longer um, they they all tend to go various shades of brown and beige don't they so it's um, I think that's another reason why it's an interesting proposition to think of it just as a kind of piece of costume jewellery that you wear once or twice and then return to the environment um, but also what I found really interesting was um, speaking to some um, some adults who came to the workshop and particularly one lady who had loved um, making things but hadn't been encouraged to do art and design so much at school because it was mainly 2D. Mm. Um, and I find that's that's comes through quite a lot is that um, and, and unfortunately now as well with with how the arts aren't really being supported very well in schools anymore um, and that um, people aren't getting to access those um, sort of more resistant materials in sort of 
uh, metal and wood, etc., that they're not doing as much designing and making through 3D kind of drawings in a way and model making uh, and experimentation. And uh, this lady loved it, and I, and it really made me think. Oh, you know, I hope she. I hope she embraces it and, and carries on with with the making and and loving just um, just doing the creativity in the 3D and not feeling that pressure that she needs to be good at drawing. I think drawing so some, somehow always comes in as this kind of like, oh, I can't draw. Oh, no. <laughs> um, which uh, said a lot know, in, in the community sessions. We get that all the time. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And it's I think that's something if I could just break that down um, I think that for a lot of people who work um, more intuitively with um, materials and 3D uh, things rather than in 2D I, I think that that's what hopefully these workshops give people a chance to to, to make immediate that immediacy of making with just some 3D uh, things um, and and I also have the opportunity to share some of the outcomes at um, Great Northern Contemporary Craft Fair in their discuss showcase, where it was it was more about discussing um, ideas around the future of craft, uh, and that was that was really interesting and exciting to have that opportunity. And um, I was talking about again that was a chance for me to share the processes of making, the fact that you can um, cut up food waste um, just with scissors and then reform it into these structures and encouraging other people to, to make the works themselves. So they weren't proposals for um, products to buy, they're proposals for people to go away and, and make them themselves. So lots of people were very interested and excited by that, uh, which, is, which is great. Um, I haven't had any kind of, I was hoping I might get some Instagram posts of people who've been like, oh, Rachel, look, I've made something out of food waste and what, what do you think that kind of thing I haven't had any of that yet but I'm I'm still hopeful that somebody <laughs> somebody oh, might God. um let me know that they've that they've given it a go when they've had chance so um yeah that, that would be that would be good if people have done it and I just I just don't know about it that's it I like I like the idea that you know when people now when they're going out they'll they'll buy a new dress or they'll do their hair and their nails for going out like the idea that they'll make a big piece of organic jewelry just to wear <laughs> for that night out to match what they're, they're wearing and stuff that I like that thing. idea too Emma yeah I hope that that's what people are doing <laughs> it, I'm sure they will <laughs> just might take some time for it to become common practice yeah no. oh well that's been really lovely to, to talk through some of those ideas and themes with you thank you both um I think we, that's all kind of that we've got time for um, unless either of you have any last comments or thoughts that you'd like to add that you haven't had a chance to no thanks I think this has been such a lovely chance to have a chat with with you both and discuss the work that we've that we've been making and I can really see a lot of connections between what Shane and Lara have been working on and what, what I've been doing so um yeah I think I think this this whole project Emma that you've that you've put together and been working on is, is absolutely fantastic and um it's it's so inspiring i hope that um many more people uh, will be inspired to become a commoner <laughs> thank you Rachel. that's great yeah, i'll second that that's great uh, thank, thank you. you rachel and thank you emma well thank you both so much for your thoughts and ideas and the discussion and of course your time as well we really appreciate it and i'd just like to say for anyone who is watching this um, if you'd like to comment or add to the discussion at all please do if you're going to do it on social media we have the hashtag we are commoners um, we've also still got the network blog crafting the commons so do visit the craft space website for that where you can comment on all the, the blog posts from the exhibitors and academics which uh, covers a lot of the themes we've discussed and of course if you haven't seen the exhibition yet the next venue is at the hub in Sleaford opening there on the 7th of May before it moves to Hull and then Colchester in September um, and there's also the virtual tour of the exhibition on the craft space website so do visit that but thank you again for your time and um, goodbye everyone thank you Emma. thank, thank you. you thanks all thank you. bye, bye.